we save water? How do we live within our water limits? A potato takes 25 litres to grow, a burger 2,400. Wow. The Stockholm International Water Institute has reported that we will have enough water for the world by 2050 if animal food consumption is reduced to 5% of total calories. That equates to a, a three-quarter reduction globally. In other words, that's a 95% reduction for someone on the average Australian diet. Reduction of meat and dairy. No one knows that. <laughs> Who knows that? I mean, it, it's not heard of, but it will be. Oceans, we, we've talked about that. We're trashing our oceans. Um, we've, we've ploughed our continental shelves. <laughs> this is amazing. This is the number of tr fishing capacity in the world. And this is the number of fish in the oceans. <laughs> Back in 1950, we had a relatively small fishing capacity and there were lots of fish in the oceans. Now, we have a huge fishing capacity and we've, we've uh, took the fish, taken the fisheries to the limit. The fishing fleet's gone up 10 times and the catch has gone down by half. We now have um, so much capacity in fishing that we've got three times more fishing vessels than we have fish. <laughs> that is capacity. Okay, if you were POM and you had fish and chips 20 years ago, what would it be? It would be cod because the North Atlantic was incredibly productive for cod. This is the, the, the biomass of table fish, cod mostly, on the cod banks in, on both sides of the North Atlantic. Have a look at this now. This is the density now. You can't buy cod, cod's gone. In fact, it's illegal to sell cod. It's gone. Talked about three to 400 ocean dead zones from nitrogen pollution. It's not just dead zones, the red spots are dead zones. It's also the open oceans are being depleted in oxygen. And that these areas, are, these hypoxic is, is, is uh, oxygen depletion. And hypoxic oceans have been, have been identified as a driver in past mass extinctions. Climate, I'll just touch on very briefly. It's also obvious these days, but half of the major weather extremes are climate boosted. And we're having ex examples of regional tipping points, that is sudden irreversible change. It's mostly in ice and snow, but we've got these changes happening. Syria refugees, the border between India and Bangladesh is heavily guarded because Bangladesh is so on the knife edge. The, the groundwater's gone, they're experiencing drought now, uh, seasonally, every year, because the, the water isn't coming through, the ice and snow melt isn't keeping the water up to it. In Australia, what's going to happen? By 2090, we'll see half a degree to 1.7 a degree, in a low emission scenario, and by the way, this is nonsense, it's not going to happen, it's already past that. But the high emission scenario, which is probably what we'll see, we'll, pu we'll push it in 2.8 to 5.1 degrees. So what, you might say? So Brisbane becomes Townsville, temperature-wise. So what? That's not the point. The point is that for every one degree in warming, we've got 7% 7 7 more water vapour in the atmosphere, more uh, evaporation. So we have hotter and drier droughts and we also have more water vapour in the atmosphere and it doesn't come down in a regular way now it comes down in bucket loads so we have so disturbed the the hydrological cycles with the deforestation and with the temperature change that this is going to be how we feel it fires bushfires when you get the triple whammy you get high temperatures you get extreme evaporation extreme dry and you get high winds because there's more energy in the atmosphere so bingo one lit match and the fire's off 
the droughts last longer, they're more severe. I see that now farmers are actually asking the government to help them with rescue, with bailout packages. They want off, they want off the land. And this, folks, is dead proof that climate change is happening. <laughs> it's all, all too clear. This is uh, <laughs> West Coast America recently, last year. The bushfires over there were something of a spectacle. And this is a lot of people. Not affecting me. <laughs> Well, it will be soon. Methane from these four-legged creatures. I used to love cows. I used to think of beautiful big brown eyes. Aren't they beautiful creatures? But now I see them as methane factories. Methane alone is going to cause dangerous climate change, whether or not we stop carbon dioxide. So in other words, if you cut all global carbon dioxide to zero, stop the emissions entirely from fossil fuels, and kept up the methane, we would push the world into dangerous global warming. So let's go back to human land use. We know these crises are hitting us big time. How do we then look after our patch? How do we change what we do on planet Earth for a sustainable future? Well, maybe the forests we can't do much about, but we've got this huge area of grazing land that we can do something about just by stopping red meat consumption we can change almost three quarters of the land use. In other words, we can repurpose this to forest. We can replant this to forest and that will totally rebalance the system. As we saw, it'll draw down three decades of emissions and it will reduce our footprint on planet Earth. A vegan diet reduces land use by 3.1 billion hectares, larger than Africa by three quarters. They're not, <laughs> this is interesting now. Until the last few years, no science paper would model diets. And now they're specifically saying a vegan diet or a 100% plant-based diet. Can I ask a question? Sorry, where, what was the scope of that study then? Or, or the, where, for poor and Nemechek? How, in what country would you, can you remember? It's global. Oh, it's a global. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, Netherlands Environment Assessment Agency looked at this as well and found that it's the lowest cost mitigation as well. So the cheapest way we can get out of this climate mess is reforest. Retire grazing lands, a low meat diet or an animal free diet. Animal free diet's the cheapest way to go. We save 80% of the cost. Overpopulation, this is amazing. You've probably seen this before. We in the West eat 2,000 animals and 100,000 eggs in our lifetime. Isn't that gross? <laughs> I mean, isn't that amazing? <laughs> livestock now outweigh wildlife by 18 to 1, and livestock outweigh humanity by 2 to 1. So if anyone talks to you about, oh, the problem is population, it's not cattle, too many people. Well, yeah, there's a lot of mouths to feed. There's seven point something billion and there's going to be 11 billion, perhaps. But the trouble is for these critters, there's a lot more livestock mouths to feed. In fact, there's twice as many if you look at live weight of humans versus, versus live weight of animals, there's twice as many livestock to feed as humans. So if you're talking in terms of mouths to feed, it's not human population that's the problem. Um, yeah, we'll go into that. 
Meat, aquaculture, eggs and dairy use 83% of the world's farmland, provide 37% of, of our protein and 18% of our calories. For those who are worried about waste, and food waste is a, is a real issue, the most wasteful thing we do is eat animals that have eaten plants. That process is very wasteful. So if, if people are saying, oh no, the prob real problem is food waste, yes, it's a problem. But you're more wasteful by eating high on the food chain. Let's go low on the food chain. And with, if we didn't have livestock to feed, we'd have a 50% surplus of food. The Food and Agriculture Organisation have found that a few years back. That's enough to feed the coming four billion, by the way. Okay, let's look at lifestyle diseases. This is amazing. Today, there's about 4,000 Australians who are over 100. By 2050, there'll be 70,000 people over 100. Imagine that. You think of the number of hospitals that are there now. And what's the biggest cause of disease in the Western world? Diet. Unhealthy diets pose a greater risk to morbidity and mortality than does unsafe sex, alcohol, drug and tobacco use combined. The Eat Lancet Commission has done a marvellous job of putting all this together, synthesising all the the work on diet and health and environment. This is a report we did in the World Preservation Foundation. Bill Clinton had the stents put in, he had the heart attacks. He then consulted Esselstein and went on a, on a plant-based diet. You can reverse heart disease, you can reverse diabetes, you can reverse a number of things through diet. Chronic disease is responsible for 60% of death. You're less likely to have cancer, less likely to have heart disease, less likely to have diabetes if you're, ve if you're vegan. And the world's um, dietetic associations are recognising that now. And the interesting thing is, and this, this documentary that's just come out, The Game Changers, elite athletes and this is the science behind it. it, just come out this year. Elite athletes are now getting an edge on, on uh, leaner body mass, reduced blood viscosity, better blood flow, reduced oxidative stress, better recovery, reduced inflammation, better recovery. You know, the athletes used to put themselves in a, in a bath of ice water. This is to reduce the inflammation. Well, you can get that if you change your diet. Increase VO2 max. So these guys have more stamina. It, it, you know, the information's there. Um, V2 food, this is fascinating. We talk, a couple of us talking about this before. The CSIRO has got together with the guy who owns Hungry Jacks. And they developed this V2 food thing. They developed these burger patties that chew like beef, taste like beef, <laughs> smell like beef, <laughs> eat like beef. The CSIRO, God bless them, have put out a, a uh, CSIRO diet that was meat heavy. Well, now they've, re <laughs> they've redeemed themselves because they've now taken that technology from years of working with Meat and Livestock Australia, that technology that works out, okay, what are, what are the volatile things? What are the, what are the things in meat that make it taste good? And they've used that technology for, and, and the guy who owns Hungry Gats has, has now committed $22 million to building this product, this factory to produce plant-based meats. So within a year or so, we'll see massive promoting, promotion of this. This is Australia's uh, version of the Beyond Meat and the Impossible Foods that's happening in the States. So what's your personal footprint? If you look at where, where, where am I personally on this scale of uh, land use? How much does it take to feed me, to sustain me? 
if, if you want to halt global biodiversity loss, the most effective thing you can do is right up that end, go vegan. If you want the world to have sufficient water to supply to support humanity by mid-century, what do you do? You eat up at the vegetarian end. If you want to stop deforestation, you don't eat red meat. That's the world's pastures. If you want to stop nitrogen pollution, they recommend halving your meat intake. And if you want to stop global warming, draw down three decades of emissions, or nearly two to three decades, you cut red meat out of the diet. Um, that's what, that's what happens. So that's the end of that.